Um, and we'll probably have time to, to do lecture nine too, because lecture nine is only 10 slides. Um, and they're really pretty simple, okay? Um, it's really just introducing another class that you can use, um, but it's a more complicated class than most, okay? There's no, no quiz assigned uh, for today. Uh, program four is due on 11.10. I really recommend that you not wait until after the exam uh, to, uh, to attempt that project, okay? Uh, make your first attempt, get that submitted as soon as possible. Um, I know that I've got like two submissions so, so far, um, and I haven't had a chance to review them yet, but I'll, I'll get to it soon, okay? Um, just kind of get that out of the way, okay? Uh, so that you can concentrate on the test um, and then uh, just make, re make revisions to the program. Not to mention, doing the program will actually help you with the test, okay? Um, so you really should do it before the test, okay? Speaking of the test, um, that will uh, open up Thursday after class, so at 12.20 p.m. Um, you'll have uh, almost five days to complete it, so more than enough time for you to work on that. Um, it's basically assigned for the same hours as a quiz would be, okay, but it is significantly longer than a quiz, obviously. Um, it'll take, it, it should take an hour and 20 minutes, uh, but I didn't want to take a class to do it, um, so we'll just, uh, you know, we'll do it as homework, okay? Um, so, yeah, there's that. Um, <laughs> You're reading, I think I've said this about a billion times so far, but you should be reviewing chapters 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7. 5 and 6 were just review. 1 and 2 we've already covered in the test review. Um, so you really should be focused on uh, chapters 3 and chapter 7. And also repeating this reading assignment for 9.7. We're skipping chapter 8 because that's just on single dimensional arrays. Um, the syntax for arrays is slightly different than in C, uh, but it's really very, very similar. Um, plus, we're going to replace arrays with the array list, which is what chapter 9.7 is on, um, because it helps to alleviate some of the issues that you find with arrays. So, uh, more on that during the lecture. But then chapter nine is just on multi-dimensional arrays, so two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, 15-dimensional arrays. Um, but 9.7 is on array list, okay? Um, and then we'll start chapter 10. Chapter 10 is kind of the climax of this course, okay? Uh, so we'll spend most of the semester actually on the rest of chapter 10, okay? All right. Um, is Ansar here? Okay. Uh, well, he was he was here for the other class. Um, so uh, you should have received an announcement that talks about his office hours and when you can meet him, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, he's available now. And he's certainly available to help you with program four. He sh really shouldn't help you with test one, uh, but he probably will if you go and ask. I have told him not, explicitly not to help you with that. Um, I don't know what will happen if you ask him for help. But anyway, anyway, uh, if you have problems with program four, you certainly should talk to him. If you have trouble understanding anything that we're talking about in this class and you just need more examples or anything like that, um, you should go see him, okay? Uh, and of course, my office hours are still available to you. Um, not many people have come during my office hours. I hope that means that you're all getting all this stuff 100%, but I know that that's not the case. So, um, you know, feel free to come during my office hours. You don't need an appointment or anything like that, okay? Um, but he is available to you now, okay? I remember he got to the hospital. Are there any questions? I'll eventually get to it, but. <laughs> all right, I will take the roll. Uh, we'll probably have a short class today, um, but we'll see. Uh, I'll take the roll, then I'll resume the test one review, okay? Hey, Amelia, did you get the video for it? Landry? Hmm? Did you Austin, get the video for it? Dylan? Oh, you're doing it. Lane? Philip? Okay. Sydney? So you haven't done the first one yet? Catherine? Okay. Tanaya? Right. Taylor? 
Bailey, Benoit, Clint, Clint, Karina, Mana, Trevor, Zaid, Rama, Sonia, Craig, Craig, Allison, Anthony, Venkata, Alexandria, Frank, here. Jarrett, <coughs> Brooke, Wong, Wong. That's not letting me type. Gabrielle. Yeah, that's not letting me type. Steven. Okay. Eric. Here. Emilio. Here. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Andrew. Andrew. Jason. LaShawn. Sean. And Haley. Miss anybody? Anybody in Guru's name and not? Why did you want that video? All right, mm -hmm. let's get back to the review. <laughs> so I mentioned before that we're going to be redoing this section on static uh, because it is kind of complicated. Okay, um, so yeah, this this should be review, but you know if it's not, it's not. Let's uh, let's try blowing this up and see if uh, see if that'll work. Okay, so we've got this class called Breed of Dog. Uh, it has an average weight and a name of the breed. Um, it has a constructor. Uh, the, the default constructor just sat, sets the average weight to zero uh, and the name of the breed to an empty string, okay? The uh, argument constructor takes an average weight and a name and it sets the average weight to the average weight and the name of the breed to name, okay? That's all that's relevant for this particular question. So it says, copy the code above to your answer and add a static variable to keep track of the number of memberships. Okay, so uh, last time I described uh, what static variables are for. I'll repeat it now, okay? Just remember that a static variable is a variable that's common to all members of the class, right? So Siberian Huskies, uh, German Shepherds, Poodles, whatever, okay, will all have the same number of breeds. I said memberships here, I apologize. Um, but they will all have the same number of breeds, right? Yeah, so if I've created zero so far, it'll be zero. If I've created 19 breeds so far, okay, <coughs> it'll be 19. <coughs> as opposed to the name of the breed and the average weight, which has to be different for each breed, right? Okay, Okay. so first we're gonna add a static variable to keep track of the number of, mem of uh, breeds, okay? Okay, so you can see that I copied the code here, okay? Um, and the first step is just to add the static variable. We still want it to be private because we don't want anyone else coming along and setting my number of breeds to three when I've created 19 of them, right? Yeah, so we still want this to be private, okay? What should, what type should it be for the number of breeds? Just an end because you'll never have 2.3 breeds, right? That would just be weird, okay? So it'll be an end. Number of breeds. Okay? But the kicker here is that we want it to be static, right? Because we only want one number of breeds across all of the breeds, right? Yeah? Okay? So that's how you create a variable. Okay, now we're supposed to add code that will increment the variable when a breed is instantiated by a client class. How can a client go about instantiating a new breed of dog? By calling the constructor. The only way they can do it is by calling the constructors, right? Now I've got two separate constructors here because there's two ways that I can go about creating a breed, either with no information or with an average weight and uh, a name, right? Okay, so in both of the constructors, I have to increment the number of breeds. By the way, <clears throat> optionally, I can say, when I first start off, the number of breeds will be zero, right? right? 
But this is automatically initialized to zero in Java, so this is completely optional. It doesn't matter if you put it in there or not. Okay? Okay, so if they create a breed of dog with no information, I still need to increment the number of breeds. So I just do that. Number of breeds plus plus. Yeah? Or I could do number of breeds plus equals one, or number of breeds equals number of breeds plus one, whatever, okay? Yeah, it's all the same, okay? But notice that also when I call the constructor with an average weight and a name, I also need to increment the number of breeds, right? Okay? Okay? All right. Now, we want to add a static method that will return the value of the static variable. Static methods are even more difficult to understand than just static variables, okay? I think by now you've probably got something of an idea of when you have to make a variable static. When you make a um, a method static, you get the advantage of you don't have to have an object of that class in order to call that method, right? That's why main is static, by the way, right? Because the JVM, when it goes to run your class, it doesn't want to call a constructor, right? Yeah? Okay? So um, my getter for the number of breeds should also be static in case I've created zero of them. Right? Right? Because then I don't have an object to call it on. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. Yes. Well, you'd import uh, breed of dog, is all. Well, I mean, like, you know, I'm just giving it. Yeah, you, you do have to import. Okay? Um, I forgot my train of thought now. Um, so anyway, uh, get number of breeds should be callable before I've ever created a breed of doll. Okay, that's the advantage of a static method, and it's, it's a very minimal uh, advantage. The restriction on a static method is very very harsh. Okay. Because it can be called before the object is ever instantiated, it can't access any of the members of the class, right? With the exception of static members, because they do exist before an object exists, right? Okay? Um, so you won't see many static methods, but if you have methods that only use the static members, okay, you should go ahead and make them static, okay? So, here's how we do that. It's just going to be a regular getter, so uh, it's going to be public because I want this callable by the outside world, right? Anybody should be able to check on my number of reads, okay? And then we're going to make it static because it's said to make it static, yes? Um, it's going to return an integer because the number of reads is an integer, yes? It'll be called get number of reads. Okay, and it doesn't take any arguments. It's just a typical getter, right? And this just returns the number of reads. Okay? The only diff difference between this and a traditional getter is that this one is static because it only accesses static variables. Yeah? So we might as well make it static. Are we good? All right. So that, I think, is the hardest question on the test. The next one uses breed of dog also. That's why I'm erasing this, just to make it a little simpler on you. OK? All right. All right. Any questions on static? 
Um, of course, you won't have breed of dog, you won't have average weight, you won't have name of breed. Uh, the, var the variable won't be called num breeds or number of breeds, uh, but it this will be very similar to it, okay? okay? Any questions on static? I think this is the last time this semester that I'm going to cover static, all right? Okay, I think we did this one last time too, but it, it uh, bears repeating, okay? So you notice that I've got my breed of dog again, which you will not have on the test. You'll have some other class, okay? Again, it has an average weight and it has a name. Again, it has a constructor that just sets the average weight. Uh, to zero and the name to an empty string. And again, it has another constructor that has an average weight uh, and a string, um, and it just sets the average weight and the name. The only difference this time is that we have an equals method, okay? Um, and notice that I've already written equals, yes? Okay, this question does not require you to write equals, thankfully, okay? Now, this is a 10 point question, but it's five parts. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay? All right? It's not very complicated, though. Okay? So, in a client class and inside the main method, and you notice that I've, all, I've provided the header for the main method here, okay? So you don't have to remember that, okay? We're supposed to instantiate an object using the default constructor. Well, what would that look like? New breed of dog. Well, New breed of dog, yeah. Um, but we have to assign it to a variable as well, right? Okay. Okay, so let's do that. So let's do a breed of dog. And I'll just name it breed one. <laughs> yes. Equals new breed of dog. And it's said to use the default constructor, and that's what I just did, right? Pretty simple. Part two. Now we're supposed to instantiate an object using the argument constructor, okay? Notice that the argument constructor takes a weight and then a name, okay? So I'll do breed of dog. And I'll actually name this Siberian Husky because I have a Husky and he's cute. Okay? Equals new breed of dog. But now I want to use the argument constructor, okay? The argument constructor is right here and it takes a weight and then a name, right? Okay? So the average weight of a husky is somewhere around 75.4 pounds. Yeah, at least that's what my husky weighs. He's not unusually big or small, so, okay. Um, and the name of the breed would be Siberian Husky. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Pretty easy so far, okay. Steps three and four are not much more complicated. Now we're supposed to set the average weight of the object instantiated in number one. What do, what, what do we call the thing that we instantiated in number one? Breed one. Breed one, right? Okay, so in breed one, we want to set the average weight And we'll make it a small dog, we'll say 8.27121 pounds. Yes? Are we good so far? Yes? Okay. Step four isn't more complicated. We're supposed to set the name of the object instantiated number one. And we would do that with breed one dot set name um, and we'll make this a Boston Terrier okay pretty simple right okay the crux of this question comes in number five and that's where we're supposed to use the, the equals method that was written right 
Okay? Determine if the objects contain the same data. If they are, print an appropriate message. Okay? How do we check to see if two objects contain the same data? That is precisely the purpose of the equals method, right? Yes? Okay. So we'll do if breed one dot equals. What can I compare it to? There's only one thing to compare it to, compare it to. Siberian Husky. Okay? Siberian Husky. Okay? So if their data is the same, then it just says print, a, print an appropriate message. Uh, System.out.println and appropriate message. Because you should never pass up the opportunity to be a smart ass. Okay? <laughs> now, it didn't say to do anything if they're not equal, so that's all that's required. Yeah? When you receive this question, of course, you won't have breed of dog. You'll have some other class. Um, you won't have an average weight or a name. Okay? You'll have whatever it has. Okay? Uh, but it will be pretty much like this. Okay? Okay? Values to set it to, or are we still well, That's what we You're just supposed to make the mark. Oh. We good? Questions? All right. Now on to new stuff, right? Question 10 is just repetition. Oh, wow. Well, we did this one too, I think, didn't we? No? Okay. Um, so I need a marker. Let's see how these are going to work. All right. First time for everything. Okay, so you're just supposed to say what is the output of the following code. Um, you will only receive one of these questions, but I did two examples here, okay? Um, and I recommend that you just walk through the code and do what it would do, right? Okay. So uh, for this first one, the, the one that's on the left, I've got int x equals 11. <laughs> so x is equal to 11, right? And while x is greater than 1, is it? Yes. Okay. So I output 11, and then I do this mess. Yes? This is a ternary if, right? Okay? So I check this condition. If it's true, I do this. If it's false, I do this, right? That's all it is, okay? So if x mod 2 is equal to 0, is it? No, it's 1, right? Yeah? Okay? So I skip this and I do this. So I've got x equals x minus 3. That changes x to 8. Good? Okay. Then I go back up to the while loop. Is x greater than 1? Yes. yes. So I output x. All right. Then I do this comparison again. Is x mod 2 equal to 0? Yes. yes. So that means that I do this and skip this, right? So x equals x minus 2. So this becomes 6. And that's the end of the while loop. So I'll go back up to the while loop. Is x greater than 1? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I output it. And then I do this. Okay. Is x mod 2, mod two equal to 0? Yes. yes. So I do x equals x minus 2. This becomes 4. Yeah? And I reach the end of the while loop. So I go back to the beginning. Is x greater than 1? Yes. OK, so I output it. Is this line? Uh, is 4 mod 2 equal to 0? Yes. So I do this. 
and that's the end of the while loop, right? So I go back up here, is x greater than one? Yes. So I output it, okay? Is x mod two equal to zero? Yes. So x equals x minus two. That's the end of the while loop. Is x greater than one? No. So this is the output, all right? I'll tell you right now, I'm not gonna give you like a semicolon after the while loop because that would be evil of me, right? That would be a trick question. Um, I'm not looking to trick you on these questions. I'm just looking to see if you know what a loop does, right? Yeah? Are we good? Okay. All right. So you might receive a while loop or you might receive, oh no, horror of horrors, a do while loop. Right? A do while loop is just like a while loop, except for it's guaranteed to happen at least once. All right? Obviously, you're going to receive different numbers than this, but it probably will contain um, a modulus. Um, an ternary if, okay? Okay, so, ooh, starting x at 13 this time. Okay, then we do the following. So we do it no matter what, right? Don't check its condition, all right? We output 13, and then we do this. Is x mod two equal to zero? No, okay? So we do x minus three, right? Okay? So x becomes 10, okay? Is x greater than one? Yes, so we output it. Is x mod two equal to zero? Yes, so we do x equals x minus one, right? So this goes to nine. Is nine greater than one? Yeah, so we continue on. We output a nine. Is x mod two equal to zero? No. Okay, so we do x equals x minus three, right? Yeah? So that becomes six. Is x greater than one? Yes. Okay, so we output it. Is x mod two equal to zero? Yes, so this becomes five. Okay, is x greater than one? Yes, so we output it. Isn't this exciting? Yes. Is x mod two equal to zero? No, so we do x equals x minus three, and x becomes two. Is x greater than one? Yes. Okay, so we output it. Is x mod two equal to uh, zero? Yeah, okay. So we just subtract one. Is x greater than one? No, so that ends the loop. And this is really all I wanna see, okay? Remember that if you want to include more information to try to get partial credit, put it in comments, okay? Yes? Any questions on this? So that tests your, uh, obviously your while loops or your do while loops. Uh, it tests your ability to interpret a ternary if and modulus, right? But you will receive different numbers, so don't just put that as your answer and not read the question, right? Are we good? Okay. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, this is a simple decision, okay? Just ifs and elses, right? 
Here again, I'm not going to try to trick you by intentionally messing up the indentation. Okay? Again, that would be kind of evil, but I could do it if I wanted, but I won't. Okay? Given the nested if structure, answer the question below. If x is currently 7, a is 2, and b is negative 3, what will x become after the above statement is executed? Okay? And here is your complicated if. All right? Okay? So, uh, we start if with is a greater than 0? Yes, it is. So that means that we're going to throw this out. We're not going to do this no matter what, right? But we enter this more complicated if, right? Okay? So the next question is, is B less than zero? Yes, it is. Okay? So that means that we throw all this out, right? Yeah? X equals X plus 5. Well, what's 7 plus 5? It's 12. Okay? So the answer is 12. Everybody agree? Okay. Okay, uh, let's set B equal to negative 2 this time, or A equal to negative 2. Okay, and let's try it again. So is A greater than 0? No. Okay, so we just do this statement, so X would be 9. Yes? Okay. Uh, let's try A is 6 and B is 3. Okay? I don't know if I can keep track of this. Okay, let's, let's do this. Uh, A equals 6 and B equals negative 3. Okay? So, is A greater than 0? Yes. So, we discard this. Okay? Is B equal, uh, is B less than zero? Yes. Okay, that was, we already did, did that, I'm sorry. But uh, X equals 12, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's do B equals three. Is A greater than zero? Yes. Is B less than zero? No. So we ignore this statement, but we enter all of this, right? Is A greater than 5? Yes. So we do this and ignore this. So we add 4 and we get 11. Yeah? Yes, 10. No, 11. It is 11. So we do this one and we ignore this one. 6 plus 4? 7. 6 plus 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 all right? So you'll receive one question like that. You'll have different numbers, okay? Um, but I don't think that that's terribly challenging. That's why it's only a five-point question. Yeah? All right? So now that I've lulled you into complacency, let's try a hard one. Oh, this isn't too bad. <clears throat> All right. We're supposed to write Java statements to instantiate a random number generator object named random generator and to generate a random integer between 100 and 250 inclusive. Okay? So this is going to be two statements, right? One to, to instantiate the generator, okay? And one to generate the number. Remember that in class we have only talked about the version of next int that only takes one int. Okay? If you call the version of next int that takes two, then you're breaking the rules of the syllabus. Okay? And I will take off appropriately. Okay? Okay? So, first, how do we go about generating a, uh, well, creating a random generator? Let's go ahead and copy. So obviously this is inside of main somewhere, right? Okay. So the random class is the random number generator that we talked about, right? Yeah. 
Um, you can call this thing anything. Let's call it random generator. Yeah? Equals. And how do I instantiate a random? By calling new. the constructor. Yeah, new random. <clears throat> what does it take as arguments? <clears throat> Nothing. Nothing, right? There is a there is a version that takes a seed, right? Uh, but we don't ever use that version, okay? Because we want to generate different random things every time, right? Okay, now I'm ready to uh, I'm ready to uh, start generating. So let's just do. I didn't say to print it out or anything, so let's just do int random int equals, and I have to do the random generator dot, what's the only method that we talked about in the random class? Next in. Next in. Okay. Well, okay, we also talked about next boolean and stuff like that. The only one that we ever used is next in. All right. What is the formula for um, generating a random number? What's that? Yes. In the parentheses goes max minus min plus one. Okay. The other way to remember that is that it's just the number of things that you want to pick from, right? Okay. So the max here is what? 250. 250. Minus the min, which is what? 100 plus 1. Okay? So really what I'm doing is I'm generating between 0 and 150 here, right? That's what that means. Yes? Okay? Then, outside the parentheses, I need to add the minimum again. Okay? And that will make me generate between 100 and 250. Ta-da! Okay? If this generates between 0 and uh, 150, and I add 100 to it, then it's between 100 and 250, right? Yeah? We're good, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The next one's a little trickier, but you might receive one like it. Okay. Write Java statements to instantiate a random number generator object named random generator. Oh, I did say a name of it. And I just happened to call it that. That's amazing. Okay. And to generate a random integer between negative 5 and 20. Okay. How many things am I trying to pick from there? 25. 26. 26. Okay, because it's inclusive, right? But you don't have to remember that, right? Okay? All that you have to do is plug it into the formula. Yeah? Okay? So we do max minus min plus 1. What's the max? 20. Yes? What's the minimum? Minus negative 5. Yes? Plus 1. Yes? Now, of course, you could just do 20 plus 5 plus 1, right? That means that I'm picking between 26 different integers. That's what I want, right? But right now, it's generating between 0 and 25, right? And that's not what I want. I want to add the minimum, OK? Yeah? And that will make it you know, reduce all of those numbers by 5, so that'll be between negative 5 and 20, OK? Yeah? Now, of course, this is exactly the same as this, okay? Or this, 
Yes? Yeah? Or this? Yes? Or this? Yes? Or I don't know what that was. Anyway, you get the idea, right? Anything that works mathematically, right? Okay? So we know how that works? Any questions on it? Okay? All right. Ready for the next question? This one's a doozy. Okay? Now, your, ne your next question will be different from this. Okay? But it will still have two different string delimiters. Okay? And that's really all that matters. Okay, let's take a look. Look at that question. <laughs> okay, there's a string variable named formatted name that contains the name of a person in this format. Last name, comma, first name, space, middle name. Yes? Okay. Examples are Alger, comma, David, space, Lee, or... Taylor, comma, Frank, space, C, right? Yeah? It's just last name, comma, first name, space, middle name, okay? Notice that there's no space after the comma, though, okay? That's very important for what we're going to do. Are we good? Okay. For simplicity, you can assume that there is exactly one comma character and one space character in the string formatted name, and that the comma character is before the space character, okay? So there's no extra commas or spaces in there, right? Yeah? Okay. Here you go. Write Java code to output the number of characters in the email address, oops, <clears throat> in the name, sorry about that, and to print the first name of formatted names. So, in our examples, we want to print out David or Frank without any spaces. Yeah? You see what we're trying to do? Okay. So first, we want to get the number of characters in formatted name. That, that part's easy. Okay. This is worth 10 points, by the way. Okay, so we have formatted name. Okay. How can I get the number of characters in that? Couldn't you technically get the length minus two? So it said the number of characters, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to include the space and the comma because that's part of the formatted name. Okay. Okay. So what do I need to do? Just length. Yeah. And I want to print that out, it said. So system.out.println, format a name, dot length. That part's easy. Yes? Okay. Now we want to output the first name. Uh-oh. Okay. So I'm going to start with a system.out.println because I know I'm going to print something out. Right? Okay. I know that... It's going to be formatted name dot substring, right? I only need to find out where the first character is and where the last character is, right? Yes? Okay. So, given that the last name, in my examples here, we see we have a five-character last name. And then we have a six character last name. So we really don't know how long the character is going to, the first the names are going to be. Where do I want to start at? The comma. The comma. How can I get the comma? Yes. Okay. So I have to do formatted string. Dot index of and I just want to look for a comma. Right? Everybody agrees that's where the string starts, right?
right? Please? Yes? Okay. Now, we need to figure out the end index, right? Yeah? By the way, if I start this at the comma, won't it include the comma in the name? Yes. Yes. So I need to advance that character by one, right? Sneaky. Okay. So what do I need to read up to? The space. The space. Okay. So that's just formatted string. Dot index of. In the uh, on the test, you're going to have an email address because I kind of spilt the beans on that, right? The email address will only have one at character and one period character, right? Okay, so it'll also be a three-part string. But you may be required to get the first part of that string, the middle part of that string, or the end of that string, right? Yes. Okay. To test this, by the way, you can type it into your compiler. Okay, um, and you could just do, um, just add a line like this, right? You would just do string formatted name equals Alger David Lee, right? Okay, and then you could check to see that it, that it got the right number of characters and that it printed out the right substring, right? Um, but this shouldn't be part of your answer for the question, right? Yeah? So once you verify that that works, you would just delete this and submit it. Yes? we still fluid at the public static coordinates? You can or not. I'll it. Everybody got it? I know it's kind of evil. All right, now I think we're up to the last question. Uh, next one, okay, next to last question. This is also from last semester. So the only thing you have to remember is that C is different from Java in that you don't just say pi, right? And you don't just say square root or SQRT. Instead, you have to do math.py or math.sqrt, right? Otherwise, this is a question from last semester. Yeah? Okay? Your formula will be different, but it will include a pi or an e, possibly. Uh, it will include a square root. It will include an exponent, but it'll be a different formula. Okay? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right. So... Uh, we're supposed to write a Java statement to calculate the value of this formula. Okay, so I'll do, and again, you don't have to include main, okay? Um, int result equals, now I've got to do one third pi, right? Okay, so one third pi. We'll just start there. I made two errors already. What are they? Uh, not calling math.py and doing integer math. That's right. Okay, so there is no value of pi, unlike in C, right? Okay? In Java, you have to do math.py. Okay? Also, 1 divided by 3, well, 1 is an integer and 3 is an integer, so it does integer division, right? Yeah? So what is 1 divided by 3? Zero. Zero. Oops! Right? Okay. So I can fix that by just doing 1.0 over 3, right? Or I can fix it by doing 1 over 3.0, just anything to make it a double, right? Okay. I can also do 1 over 
1.0 over 3.0, right? Or I could just do math.pi. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, okay. Um, by the way, if I do something like this, don't forget that you have to put the multiplication in there, right? Yeah? <coughs> Just writing things next to each other doesn't mean multiplication in C or in Java. Okay? Okay, so we've got the one third pi. Yes? Okay? Let's go on. I can see that there's a minus a square root here, so let's just do that. Minus SQRT of something. No, SQRT doesn't exist in Java, right? Yeah, you have to do math.sqrt. Yeah? Okay, what are we taking the square root of? Z to the n plus 1. Okay, that's going to be pal of z to the n plus 1 over something, right? Mm -hmm. Math dot pal, because pal doesn't exist, right? Right, you have to do math dot pal. Yeah. All right. Then, it's just over x, kind of anticlimactic there. But there you go. That is a much more complicated formula than I'd be comfortable giving you last semester, okay? But I think it's more than doable this semester, yeah? Especially when you have a compiler. You can just plug it into the compiler and make sure that your parentheses all match and all that kind of stuff. Yeah? Any questions? I didn't say to output it or anything. So, there you go. Questions? Okay, last question. You don't have to import math because it's in java.lang, remember? Java.lang is automatically It just shows this. Oh, uh, yeah, for the random, you really should have imported it, but I'm not, I'm not I did nothing that. Good question. Unlike Taylor's question. <laughs> we good? Yeah. All right. Question 14, last question of the exam. It's just a five pointer. And to be really anticlimactic, it's just a switch. Okay? Okay, given the switch statement where x is an int, answer the questions below. If x is current, currently equal to five, what will, be the, the, what will the value of x be after the switch statement executes? Okay. It reads case three, right? But it's not case three. It doesn't match case four. Oh, but it matches case five, right? Okay, so x is now equal to nine. Everybody see that? Okay, but it doesn't break. So it goes on to this. So x becomes 10, right? And then it breaks out of the switch. So the answer to this question is 10, right? Okay. What if x is equal to 3? Then it becomes 5, then it becomes 2, then it becomes 6, then it becomes 7, and then it breaks. Right? What if x is 6? Then it becomes 7, and then it breaks. Right? What if x is 12? x is still 12. Right? Yeah? What if uh, x is 8? Then it becomes 7. Then it becomes 8 again. I left out the semicolon. Sorry about that. Okay? So it's 8. Yeah? Pretty easy stuff, right? 
Are there any questions? We. Huh? We're all gonna ace this, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Extra credit. Don't forget. Yeah, no. Don't forget that if you bomb this test, okay? If you get a forty on this test, okay? You can still earn up to half of your points back with the extra credit assignment that will be assigned afterwards, okay? So if you get a 40 on the test, you can still get a 70, perfectly respectable score, okay? Um, with, uh, with the extra credit, all right? So don't give up on me. Good? For next semester? Yeah. I made the four minutes. Any questions? Make sure to read the questions, okay? And the test opens on Thursday, okay? On Thursday, though, we will have a normal lab, okay? And not only that, but a pretty complicated lab, okay? So make sure that you come on Thursday, okay? All right. Now, let's start lecture nine. I'm probably chilling with the TV too. If you want, can do that. Hmm? I can put it for you. Oh, either you can no, it doesn't take pictures or anything. Uh -oh. I just focus on the uh, okay. So, 14, right. this is incomplete. Uh, I do that. I mean, you can, you can, like, yeah. you can also want to do that. Huh? Copy and paste the code and see if it's correct. We're about to uh, cover a different type of for loop, actually, in this lecture, so. Hopefully Enhanced you understand four, four loops. Yeah. Enhanced four loops. Okay, so <laughs> chapter nine is on multi-dimensional arrays, which we're gonna skip.